Hi, Anne-Marie, how are you? I'm fine. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Nice to see you. And you, absolutely. <laughs> this is a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. I, I still remember the wonderful interview we did a few years ago. I, and it, I was just thinking about uh, the various roads we've traveled. Yes. I'm just sorry I can't be there in person. Not a problem at all. It's great to see you. You too. And you're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I appreciate that. All right. I think Anne-Marie can kick us off. All right. Uh, so good morning to everyone uh, and welcome to Unpacking the Education, Labor and Workforce Impact of NSF Engines. Uh, America's broadest investment in regional innovation ecosystems. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as CEO of New America. And whether you're in the room or uh, virtual as I am, uh, thank you for joining us. And yes, and if you could be a little quiet in the room. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a... Uh, a, a a first for us uh, in terms of really being able to do these hybrid events the way we want to. And I can't imagine a better event or person uh, to kick us off with uh, than Director Panchanathan, who really I always called Panch, although not in his uh, elevated directorship of the NSF, but New America has had a partnership with ASU for many years. Uh, and Panch and I worked together, uh, I interviewed him, uh, for a, a, a public television show, and it's just such a pleasure to see him in his role and to welcome him to New America. So for those of you who don't know us, uh, New America really has its roots in technological and social change. We were founded in 1999, anticipating the technological and social change that was already underway and that is bringing us truly a new America. Uh, technological innovation, of course, has resulted in tremendous positive impact uh, on America in the world, uh, but also uh, it has come to be associated with an immense concentration of wealth, power, and influence. Like everything else, technology is neither inherently good or inherently bad. But we believe that technological innovation does not have to result in a narrowing of opportunity uh, and really, that's what our discussion today is about. New America is really pioneering a new kind of think and action tank where a civic platform that connects a research institute, a solutions network, a media hub, and a public forum. And you're going to see elements of all of that uh, today. Uh, we are dedicated to renewing the promise of America, a promise of equality and liberty and justice and democracy. Uh, and to grapple with the rapid changes that that technological uh, and social uh, forces create, but also to seize the opportunities they provide. So for today, we're going to be talking about seizing the opportunity afforded by one of America's broadest investments uh, in technological innovation. Uh, in th so this July, will mark the second anniversary of the bipartisan Chips and Science Act, which was a multi-billion dollar uh, re-embrace of industrial policy in the United States. Many of us think of the Chips and Science Act in terms of the chips, uh, the huge investments in critical semiconductor manufacturing capacity. But as Representative Frank Lucas, who was chair of the House Committee on Science uh, and IT, emphasized, it's the science part of the Chips and Science Act that will be, and I'm quoting, the engines of America's economic development for decades to come. So that's what we're talking about today. We are gathering to discuss those engines, the National Science Foundation Regional Innovations, Regional Innovation Engines. The science part of the Chips Act had many contributions but a signature impact was the expansion of the NSF's mission and the creation of this NSF engines program across the country. So NSF engines implements Congress's vision of catalyzing new industries, new jobs, new opportunities, 
stemming from emerging technology investments. NSF engines aim to democratize the benefits, the opportunities, the prosperity of that technology across the country, across a nationwide innovation economy. So at New America, we've been focused on how NSF engines and the broader return of America's industrial policy can be harnessed for our nation's ability to maintain global leadership and ensure that more people can share in the benefits of that leadership, particularly the technological leadership at home. That means better aligning technology and talent development in these ecosystems, again, across the country. So concretely, to emphasize just how important education, workforce, and labor stakeholders are to making this work a success, Earlier this year, our own First Lady, Jill Biden, a community college professor, Dr. Biden, joined uh, NSF Director Panchanathan to announce the first NSF engines, not in Silicon Valley, not Boston, not New York City, where I'm sitting right now, but at Forsyth, Forsyth Tech Community College in North Carolina. And that is exactly a symbol of where we need to go with our technological development. So now that the, the inaugural engines have been announced, it's critical to think about how we seize this moment. Congress will need to act and follow through on its funding commitments outlined in the Chips and Science Act to make sure that communities with NSF engines don't have the rugs pulled out from under them. And we will need to focus very intently and very concretely on turning good ideas into positive outcomes. So the questions are, how can federal investment in technological innovation lead to a renewal and rebuilding of the American middle class? How can we assure that the technological hubs of tomorrow look more like the nation than Silicon Valley does today? What steps can be taken to help federally funded innovation ecosystems create quality jobs, really good jobs that raise the American standard of living? What's the best way for community colleges, labor unions, and community organizations to partner with the research in universities and economic development entities leading NSF engines? And here we have many, many great research universities. They're very important, but so too are community colleges, technical universities, concentrations of smart people doing research and teaching. So those are the questions that have been at the core of New America's Future of Work and Innovation Economy Initiative, uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, we are dedicated to that intersection of labor, workforce, technology, and opportunity. And it, we really couldn't have a better way to kick this off than this discussion today uh, with the National S uh, Science Foundation and Director Panchanathan. So thank you, uh, Panch, I will say, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we really look forward to advancing this shared mission together. To our audience, thank you again. And then with that, Shailen, back over to you. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne-Marie, and, and thanks very much to all of you for being here. I, I, Anne-Marie couldn't have said it um, any better. Um, we're delighted to be here with you today, uh, Dr. Panchanathan. My name is Shailen Jotishi. I serve as Senior Advisor for Education, Labor, and the Future of Work here at New America. Uh, I head up our Future of Work and Innovation Economy program, and we are indeed very excited to be having this discussion in this very moment. Um, Folks, we only have an hour, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction of Director Panchanathan, who probably for this audience needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway. Um, the Honorable Dr. Panchanathan is the 15th director of the U.S. National Science Foundation. NSF is a $9 billion independent federal agency and the only government agency charged with advancing all fields of scientific discovery, technological innovation, and STEM education. His distinguished career includes serving as Executive Vice President of Arizona State University, Go Sun Devils, uh, where he served on NSF's governing body, the National Science Board, for six years. 
The director has served in sector leadership roles for dozens of national and global entities, including the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, where we first met. Um, Dr. Punchinthan, I'd be remiss if I didn't say your work inspired my own career in science and innovation policy. So it, it is an honor for us to have you here, but it's an honor for, for me to be having this discussion with you. Thank you. Um, and with that, let's dive right in. Um, Director Panchanathan, let's level set for the audience. We have science policy stakeholders here, but we also have communities from workforce development and labor and education. Um, maybe a two-part question, building on Anne-Marie's remarks. Um, what is NSF Engines, and how do you see NSF Engines being harnessed to help rebuild the middle class in America? Uh, Shalin, uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and Anne-Marie, has been a tremendous leader, and I've known her for many years through her work in many, many places. But new, what New America is doing is really stellar. And uh, we have really enjoyed watching that when I was at Arizona State and I continue to see the amazing things that you do. So thanks to New America. And to you, Shalin, um, it's nice to see you, you know, evolve through your career, and, and, and it's just, it's just true, true, a true delight. Um, to answer your question, so what I thought I would do is, for the, for the benefit of the audience, uh, before we dive into the regional innovation engines, let's talk about NSF. Because sometimes NSF becomes the best kept secret. Um, so the Natural Science Foundation, uh, this will be, uh, we are entering the 75th year of NSF. It was founded in 1950. And the reason is all of what the founding is relates to what we are talking about today. The founding really clearly outlined the mission of NSF, the great Vannevar Bush, who then outlined this at that time to President um, Roosevelt, and in the creation of this entity called the National Science Foundation. And basically, it is about promoting the progress of science, of course, science, engineering, technology, and with the explicit purpose of advancing national health, prosperity, welfare, national security, and a whole host of other priorities. Now, when you look at the journey of NSF then over the last 75 years, what we are talking about in terms of regional innovation engines, I would say has been an implicit part of what I call as the DNA of NSF. The DNA of NSF, as I talk about NSF and what it has accomplished in the last 75 years, is got two strands, like any DNA does. The one strand is the curiosity-driven, discovery-based explorations. Now, nobody will ever question if there is a Nobel Prize announced in physics or chemistry or biology or even economics that NSF has something to do with that. Yes, that's true, because NSF uh, has so far 262 Nobel laureates that we have funded early in their careers. No agency on planet Earth has got that kind of a track record. So it truly is an expression of this curiosity-driven discovery-based explorations in, in its full form, Nobel Prize being one form of the expression of that success. Now, if you look at the other strand, which NSF is also known for, but not as well attributed to, is what I call the use-inspired, solutions-focused, translations or innovations. Oftentimes, we think that that strand is done by something else or some other entity or, 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 or transfer, transferred to something else and so on. Yes, some of that is true, but NSF itself has been a tremendous champion in terms of advancing these translational applied research activities. In fact, in 1980, we founded the engineering uh, directorate at that time, right? So we have evolved, NSF has evolved over the decades. And so if you look at the work of NSF, whether it's the engineering research centers, the industry university cooperative research centers, and yes, the small business innovation research and SCTR was actually, SBAR was incubated by NSF in 1980s. Little is known about this. Now SBAR is a pretty common platform in many other agencies, but actually it was incubated by NSF in the 80s, right? So you, you can see the spirit of what we are going to be talking about today, much of today, was already embedded, and I would call it implicit, but expressing itself you know, in, in, in some form. And there are many, many success stories to point to that. And I will just take one or two examples, and then we will jump into the engine's question right away. If you look at two graduate students, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, in 1994 wrote a proposal. They were graduate research fellows funded by NSF, just to put it out there. And so was Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google. There's another thing that people don't really, you know, uh, I call them tire tracks. Assign the tire tracks back to people. 
One of the greatest things that uh, NSF unleashes is the amazing people. The greatest thing, I would argue, okay? These folks are leaders in academia, of course, Nobel laureates, entrepreneurs, successful industry leaders, incubated the industries that you hear of today that have scaled. So NSF has had its tire tracks or imprints, or you can call it the DNA imprinted in all of these, okay? So these two graduate students, when they wrote a proposal to NSF for the Digital Libraries Project, NSF funded it. Five years later, when they wrote the fi final report for the, for the project, they said we founded a company called Google a year earlier in 1998. And the rest is a trillion dollar history. Okay. Clearly, there's a lot of other things that happened to take it to that level. But NSF has some seed of that which it makes possible. And you could argue, therefore, thousands and thousands and thousands of companies all across our nation, Qualcomm, for example, was a SBIR-funded project in the early 80s when Witterby came and got an SBIR grant. It's hundreds of billions of dollars of company. I can tell you more stories about people, but we will reserve that to companies that you can relate to today. But I want to make this, 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 this point that NSF has unleashed amazing people, amazing leaders, amazing discoveries, amazing technologies, and yes, amazing companies, and continues to do that. And therefore, when I came to NSF four years ago, we're getting close to the date, almost the date of me coming to NSF, I was very keen, having seen this in action, where when the community comes together with a great university, a research university, partnering with community colleges, partnering with other institutions, partnering with the city, partnering with the state, partnering with industry, partnering with venture capital, partnering with the innovation ecosystem writ large, amazing things can be done, okay? Two, if you pick up what is akin to that place, place-based innovation, then you can build some successful ecosystems because of that, okay? So this is something that saw, we, I saw firsthand and being part of that evolution and transformation, you could say that. So when I came to NSF and saw the Endless Frontier Act that was being put together, great leadership uh, by, by Senator Schumer and Senator Young, co-sponsoring that legislation with many others, and then evolving into the U.S. Innovation Competitiveness Act called USICA, which then became the Chips and Science Act, again, a great leadership by the Biden-Harris administration, President Biden's leadership, and the total bipartisan leadership of Congress and getting this at this moment, which is a very important time for several purposes. Yes, economic security. Yes, national security. Yes, prosperity for everyone everywhere across our nation. So the Chips and Science Act was a landmark, is a landmark legislation. I'm so thrilled that it got done with a lot of appropriations for science, uh, I'm sorry, for chips, and, and, and authorizations for science. And of course, we are working on how do we get those authorizations to become appropriations because that's what will get the job done and we are working hard and we need all your help and support and we'll see you, it will tell you why it's important, okay? So when I came to NSF, I was convinced that this was the time to amplify, to augment, to unleash this implicitness that was there at NSF already, some explicit, mostly implicit, this unbelievable energy that was there of taking these amazing scientific discoveries and technologies and then partnering with the industry and economic development ecosystems and unleashing them. Why not do that at speed, at scale, and proliferating it all across the nation? So when I came to NSF, I wanted to make sure that we had, as part of this evolution of the agency and aligning with the, the chips and science, of course, as it was evolving itself, the launch of a new directorate called the Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships Directorate, the TIP Directorate. The TIP Directorate is the first new directorate of NSF in 31 years. This is the time, and there is reasons for doing it with, you know, with, with, with being very expeditious about it and scaling it fast. Okay. So among the many programs of the TIP Directorate, you could call the flagship is the regional innovation engine. So I'm just sort of diving down from NSF history to this new directorate, to the many programs. We can hopefully talk about a few of them also through the, through the discussion that we have here through the regional innovation engines. Why? Because when I came to NSF, the other thing that I was totally convinced having come from a smaller state 
is that that innovation can be anywhere and should be everywhere across our nation. Okay? Therefore, jobs, prosperity, competitiveness, all of that comes with that. And that opportunity, again, because of the fact that this then makes possible opportunity for everyone everywhere across our nation, rural, urban, across the broad socioeconomic demographic, and across the rich diversity of our nation. So opportunities everywhere, innovation anywhere. So how do we unleash that? And regional innovation engines, and NSF has been a phenomenal job. Let's be very clear about that. Through the decades, what we are trying to do right now is focus, scale, and see how we can partner. And we'll talk about how we are doing that. So that's this moment. That's why digital innovation engines are an exceedingly important portfolio, if you may, to ensure that we are keeping to this vision and mission of innovation anywhere and opportunities everywhere. Um, and Anne Marie nicely said that, that she pointed to this one in North Carolina. And if you look at the 10 regional innovation engines in our map, the type twos, and look at the type ones, close to 60 of them, they are all across our nation. That points to the fact that everywhere innovation is possible and should be you know, pursued. So I will stop there, let you explore more. Um, I'm happy to you know, go any dimension and, 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 and talk to you and give you as many details as you would want. As a professor, I tend to answer questions in long form. <laughs> yeah. Because that way you avoid other questions. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, as, as, a, as a forever student of, of science policy, I, I think it's a helpful reminder for this audience in particular that actually NSF has always been in the economic development and economic opportunity space and the roots of the iPhone and Google and all of these innovations that we, we enjoy uh, here in the United States have, have had their seeds and roots in, in NSF. By the way, as a biologist, I'm, I'm really living for these biology uh, puns with expression and genes and, and such. Well, you know, Dr. Panchanathan, I, I think about the work that, you know, the TIP directorate has done. Um, you know, I remember the announcement of the directorate at South by Southwest and uh, uh, less than a month after, you know, we, we had the opportunity to do an interview with uh, Erwin Genchandani, the head of the directorate, around the role of community and technical colleges and, and whether they have an opportunity in this 31-year uh, sort of new direction, new um, directorate that the NSF established. Earlier this year, you joined, as Emory mentioned, you joined Dr. Jill Biden, a community college professor herself, to announce this broad investment in technological innovation, you know, not in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston, where a lot of these innovations of the past have come about, but at, at a community college, at Forsyth Technical Community College in North Carolina, what role are community and technical colleges playing in engines? And um, what should the two-year sector and policymakers know about their role in, in engines and in this broader evolution at NSF? No, excellent question, Sean. You're right. I mean, it was just a, an amazing moment to be with First Lady Dr. Biden, an amazing community college professor. And as a professor, it's always in a delight to have a faculty member and the two faculty members who are doing different roles right now, um, you know, celebrate, inspire, motivate, actualize this amazing innovation engine concept that is going to be successful only, only because of those five or six community colleges, technical institutes, and five or six other um, universities, top-ranked universities, research universities. Right? all coming together with other partners, 87 partners in that regional innovation engine on regenerative medicine. I was amazed by the, the, the artificial kidney work that the company is doing, and Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, one of the very you know, stellar places, taking advantage of that innovation in place, and how do we now build this ecosystem of prosperity around a technology that can create unbelievable industries of the future and jobs of the future, for which I talked to every one of those people that were there from, from various companies, and they told me the success of those companies is going to be possible if only they have the skilled technical workforce along with the research-grade workforce. 
the skilled technical workforce is a very important ingredient for the success of all our industries. Mm -hmm. Let's take semiconductor industry. Okay. Intel, Micron, and a host of other companies, AMD and others, when they are onshoring all the advanced manufacturing capabilities here, one of the things they come to us and talk to, about, talk to us about is about skilled technical workforce. How do we inspire more K-12 students getting excited about wanting to be part of the semiconductor workforce? How do we get them, them trained with the best curriculum in community colleges and technical institutes? And of course, the universities. Okay? All of them working together. Okay? And so we're very, very excited. And we can clearly you know, talk about the semiconductor part and what we're doing there with commerce. But back to regional innovation engines, therefore, I can tell you categorically, none of the regional innovation engines will be successful if we don't have the capacity of the skilled technical workforce unleashed at full force and full scale everywhere, number one. Two, I think you know, this is a tremendous opportunity where these kinds of jobs are high paying, high skill, and that's the kind of jobs that people really want to have as part of the career development. So there is so much of appetite for that kind of, th those kinds of jobs. And these innovation engines are going to help create those at a lot more scale than what we have right now. Okay? Let me tell you, we have invested $150 million for the first two years in these 10 regional innovation engines. We have $350 million on top of that brought to these 10 innovation engines by our partners. What better success of ensuring that federal investments are bringing together collateral investments to ensure the success of these innovation engines, and most importantly, the sustainability and scalability of these innovation engines to actually create the innovation ecosystems into the future. $10 million is focused directly on community colleges building the skilled technical workforce. Let me tell you, in Semiconductor, we have partnership with Intel, $10 million with them. With Micron, the same thing. Every company is interested in this. When I go around talking to quantum companies, they tell me, Punch, we need more skilled technical workforce for the success of quantum technology, the design, development, and deployment. So it is everywhere the need. So these regional innovation engines are going to essentially make that scale of skilled technical workforce happen everywhere. OK. Now, how do we do that? Yes, regional innovation engines are going to help you know, build those skilled technical workforce. But let's not forget, NSF has had a program and continues to have a program called Advanced Technology Education. You should check it out, ATE program. Okay. This program, yes, there you go. So you know it's successful. Um, this program has been focused on development of curriculum around new technologies, emerging technologies, okay, the needs of industry, and how do we then scale the technology and mod develop models that can then be you know, translated to other institutions and so on, and focused on community colleges, four-year colleges, and so on. So NSF has been at this job. But now what we are doing is we are putting a focus, as I keep saying, to scale, to speed, to contextualize, and to partner. So we're doing all of this at this moment through this envelope of what we call the regional innovation engines. Okay? And that's going to guarantee the unbelievable jobs and the prosperity and the industries of the future being successful. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in our work at New America with, you know, in partnership with community colleges, we've we've seen the the reality on the ground. We, uh, you know, uh, I think of Central New Mexico Community College and their workforce partnership around quantum and uh, Pima Community College around autonomous vehicles, you know, Miami-Dade around AI. So um, it's, it's exciting for us in, in the workforce community to see NSF um, help scale out some of the, the successes of AT into these emerging tech sectors. And Dr. Panchanathan, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, creating these high quality jobs in the innovation economy. The Biden administration has emphasized worker power and, and revitalizing labor in really new and groundbreaking ways. We had acting Labor Secretary uh, Julie Su here on this very mm -hmm. stage. 
a um, couple of years ago talking about the work of her agency, especially on job quality and the Good Jobs Initiative. Um, what opportunities does NSF Engines create for labor unions, worker centers, worker organizations across the country to play maybe more of a role in innovation ecosystems and support the creation of you know, not just any jobs, but high quality jobs, yeah. the kinds that people would want to work and sustain a family? No, that's again a very, very good question. It takes all of this partnership to be able to deliver the outcome, okay? Clearly, labor unions, community colleges, research universities, companies, and we are increasingly bringing venture capital into this. Let's be very clear. The skilled technical workforce that we are talking about, those experts are also going to be entrepreneurs. And so we need to make sure that every possible entrepreneurial mindset that is out there is given the opportunity to exercise that in full scale. So we are bringing all, that's why I call it the ecosystem. You know, typically, you know, NSF would be thought of as funding the research universities or a certain class of universities and maybe a few community colleges and so on. And everything gets centered around that. Nothing wrong with that. Amazing things have happened and will continue to happen. But as I call it, that alone is not sufficient. We need to bring other kinds of ways in which we involve the research university, community colleges, and so on, but through partnership with the entire ecosystem coming together. And sometimes, instead of a push mechanism, it also is a pull mechanism. We have a program at NSF uh, called the Civic Innovation Challenge, where we flip the model, where the community problems are funded to be solved so that they can draw from the university the, the expertise and strengths. Instead of university going to the community and solving problems, both are important. Both are important. So at NSF, we are ensuring that we are not missing out on the through partnerships, like the partnerships that you alluded to, through these partnerships, that we are making every possible strand of opportunity and therefore innovation and success. So this is something that we are working through all the regional innovation engines. Um, and you know, I'll tell you, um, we, we are talking about type twos right now. Type twos are the ones that get $15 million of investment in the first two years when funded and when the appropriations are, uh, you know, are soon going to be made. I'm an optimist, as you can hear, uh, soon going to be made. These actually are $160 million, each of them, 1.6 billion for the 10 of them at full scale. Now, we had, um, Dr. Gain Chandani is the uh, Assistant Director of the Technology Innovation Partnership Directorate. He will tell you, we have hundreds of proposals that came in. We had 36, 34 semi-finalists. If you look at all these 34 semi-finalists, these are amazing projects, amazing projects. We had 16 finalists. I can tell you, we could have funded many more. We had to fund 10, but we did something that does not stop the innovative potential of the others. So for those which had the potential, we invested the, in them in the type one program, which is continue to seed the innovation, build the partnership, build the ecosystem, so that they too can then with time and resources as they become available, become you know, part of the regional innovation in engines uh, you know, family. But the type ones, they were the precursor, right? And uh, um, every one of those two have the partnerships of all of the folks that you talk about the labor, the economic development organizations, yes, as well as with all of the research grade and technical, uh, skill technical workforce and industry and others. So if you look at the type one, which was the first one, right, it was a very interesting experiment when we started with type one. We were convinced that innovation can be anywhere, but just because we are convinced, does it mean that it's true? So we sent out this type one call we got 700, close to 700 concept papers, okay? And Irvin and the team did something very unique. They publicized these 700 concept papers mm -hmm. so that people can see what each other is doing, which is, which is unusual in NSF. When somebody submits an idea, you just hold it like this. <laughs> but this was a different model. You can see NSF is trying different models. So this, when you publish it, people look at what others are doing and they start to hyper-partner. A couple hundred proposals. We funded in the right away 45 of them. Okay, 45 of them. 
And I tell you, I went to a few of those launches. I was amazed by the kind of ideas. And I encourage you all to go look at the RIE map. This is all in the public domain. And you see for yourself the kind of technologies, the kind of innovations that are being you know, made possible by these type one ideas. Just a million dollars. But let me talk about one as an example, if I may. I was in Reno, Nevada with our Office of Science Technology Policy Director, Arti Prabhakar, who, again, OSTP has been working very closely with us in all of this. So um, we were there launching this regional innovation engine. And I did not know, I should have known, I did not know that the only lithium mine is in Nevada. And that is going to become the largest mine in Nevada. This regional innovation engine concept that came from Nevada was University of Reno, Nevada, partnering with the community colleges, the governor's office, the economic development ecosystem, around lithium mining, extraction, processing, full life cycle, green technologies in extraction. And there is this research center at the University of Nevada, Reno, that is precisely working on the research ideas around extraction, mining, and so on, and full scale, full life cycle recycling. And they have an undergraduate concentration on battery, advanced battery technologies. The community college is building the curriculum for the skill technical workforce for the entire process of the lithium mining and extraction mm -hmm. and processing. Wow. It turns out much of the processing of lithium, we all know, is happening outside of the United States, majority of it in PRC. It's a national security issue. Okay? So here is an idea that is bringing everything together. I was excited to see the governor's office, the economic development organization, all partnering. And yes, Tesla has got their giga factory there, and they are a partner too. Now, you bring all of this together, this is like the collision that you want to see. And out of that will come unbelievable innovation, unbelievable industries. And the context is right there where it needs to happen. This is the kind of innovation engine that we are talking about, even at scale type one. Now type two, we launched the one in, on regenerative medicine kidneys in, um, in, um, in uh, North Carolina, in Winston-Salem. That is fantastic, again, you know, to have an amazing leader like Dr. Biden join us. And then, in North Carolina, we have a second one. And that one is on textiles. Of course, where would that be other than North Carolina? In partnership with Tennessee, Virginia, and others, where would that be? It would be there, isn't it? And then you go around the country in Louisiana and energy, New York and battery technologies, mm. water in Arizona. I can go around the country. And you can see that, of course, it will be there. That's the kind of thing that we need to pay attention to, is that, that we don't give enough credence to the fact that innovation ecosystems can be anywhere. And I believe that RIE is giving that, mm -hmm. making that possible. But that success is only reliant on, to back to your question, is the coming together of every component contributing to the success, getting excited, getting inspired, motivated to partner, and rooting for its success, and then making the success happen. So that is what we need more of in our country. In fact, I'll, I, I should have said this before. To me, when I came to NSF, I have always, as a graduate student in the Bell Lab days, I've always looked at Bell Labs as an amazing, amazing entity. Yes, it was a private company, AT&T. But the collision of academic researchers, fundamental researchers, and practitioners all working together and you look at many of the leaders in industry, they will tell you I had my training in Bell Labs. Okay? And I wanted to see Bell Lab-like constructs through public-private partnership akin to the innovation in every place. And that's what regional innovation engines are, is what is the Bell Lab for that place at this time that can un uh, unleash discoveries, innovation, prosperity, and so on. Yeah. So we're very excited by what can be possible by the coming together of all these sectors and lastly, I will leave with this thought. All of this at NSF can only be successful if commerce and NSF work like this. I'm so proud to say that we have a wonderful partner. Secretary Ramando and I have known each other even before. She's a phenomenal leader. 
and she and I are strong partners. Not only the chips part and implementing the chips in AI, but their regional technology hub felicitation was so aligned and Irwin and the team worked with them so that RIE and RT regional technology hubs are working like that. So that when RIEs as they scale, that they also become further scalable through RTH and other investments. So it takes all of this. This is the time and we have to make this happen. Yeah, and then when I think about, you know, partnerships, uh, you know, I think of these new um, or expanded kinds of partners in labor and community colleges and these partnerships are difficult and, yeah. you know, one way many of these regions might be able to support these kinds of partnerships is having the community college union partnerships, you know, expanded across these ecosystems, which I know, you know, Department of Labor is focused on as well as the AFL-CIO um, and others. Um, well, I, I'd be, you know, you've, you've mentioned so much, Dr. Panchanathan, that communities have invested a great deal in these engines, the type ones, the 10, large investments, as well as the 44 type twos all across now the close country. to 60 because we invested on those ones that did not right. make type two as type ones. So we scaled it 59 or 60 of them plus this 40, uh, 10 of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there are a lot of communities, a lot of states putting substantial resources and bets on these innovation ecosystems. Um, you know, you referenced this and Anne Marie referenced it in, in her remarks. Um, uh, unfortunately, Congress has not followed through um, on the budget targets it laid out and the Chips and Science Act, especially the, the science part of the Chips and Science Act. And you know, the last appropriation cycle, you know, several science agencies, including NSF, took a budget cut mm -hmm. uh, rather than following the budget increases laid out. Um, there's so much potential here for, for education, for workforce, for job creation, for economic mobility. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to these communities with engines in light of these cuts? What do, what do these cuts mean for communities? I told you I'm an optimist. So you're only going to really hear an optimist point of view. And I believe that our nation requires more optimism. Yes, we should be realistic, more optimism. Um, let me tell you, we talked about the strong support of the Biden-Harris administration. I have, I walked the halls of the hill. I was there yesterday, uh, you know, I was there several times in the last few weeks. There is strong bipartisan support for science, for technology, for innovation, okay? Let's not kid ourselves. There's strong bipartisan support. But how do we now take that support and now translate it into investments in where we are trying to see how to manage the overall fiscal, okay? Uh, realities. I get that. As a taxpayer, we all get that. But I'm making the case, and I always believe that you want to make the case for why those investments are important and what those investments really are going to make happen or ha is making happen or has made it happen. So I think it is incumbent on all of us to talk about the successes from the past the successes is happening right now and projection of successes into the future. It's our responsibility to articulate that. I always say to people, when you point a finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing back at you. So you should take care of that first, which is that we have a responsibility to articulate to the public the real value of what these investments are going to make happen. And you can do that anecdotally, and I can give you an example. AI of today that people are enjoying and having concerns, both, okay, is five to six decades of sustained investments by NSF and a few other agencies. Even during AI winters, we persisted, we invested. So what we are talking about AI today would not be there without that investment. Quantum, last three to four decades of sustained investments or more is where we are with quantum. Biotech, I can go on and on and on. But the point that I'm trying to make is the following. Yes, we are investing in those things today to further expand the opportunities, RIEs, industry university cooperative research centers, translation stuff, and so on. But we are also investing in discoveries which don't have labels which will only appear two to three, three decades from now. Mm -hmm. When you say, see that, you will say, oh, that technology was made possible because somebody is working on that lab in the discovery phase right now. 
NSF does both, as I said earlier, as part of the DNA. So it's important to articulate this. It's important. And so I, wherever I go, yesterday I was with a group of people from um, APLU, AAU, Science Coalition, and so on. I implored them to engage with our representatives, okay, to show them the impact that is being created in various communities all across our nation and talk about the potential for the future. I think we don't do a good enough job of that. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that we should take as a homework and work harder. And I can tell you, the mood, the sentiment still is to see how we can invest in spite of these challenging environments. How can we invest in the science component? There is the desire. I see that. I see that in the Create AI Act. I see that in the AI bills that are coming out. I see that in the Spectrum bill. I see all of these bills that are out there that is attempting to do the right thing always. So I applaud the, the, the congressional folks really taking this on and, and working on this. And we need to help, you know, help them, uh, help us, and so on. So that's the mindset that I bring to the table. Okay? That's a mindset that I bring to the table because that's what we need at this moment in our country. Okay? And, and not a sense of cynicism and uh, finger pointing and this and that. That's not what we need. What we need is real that. And then, to, to answer your question, the second part of your question, let's not forget, if this is that valuable, those concepts, federal investment is only one part of it. The other investments should continue to scale and I motivate my colleagues even at NSF. Let's go to industry. Let's go to economic development ecosystems. Let's go to others, philanthropy. Let's go to all these entities also and see how we can get those partners to also co-invest more. Because it's collective responsibility of all of us to make it happen yeah. at scale, at speed. Okay? So that's the approach that I take. That's the approach that NSF is taking. Because we want to make sure that we don't lose this moment. And I often characterize it as the following. I know that all of us feel that the Department of Defense should be invested in, and I feel strongly about that in the interest of national security. Okay? But I say NSF is the Department of Offense, and we need to invest in that at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Both are required. NSF is not just yet another agency. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying it is a very important agency at this important time when we are talking about global competition, yeah. when we are talking about you know, how do we outcompete, outpace our competitors like you know, PRC and others. We have to take this moment very seriously. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, there seems to be a great call to action or a call of interest for you know, journalists out there, for storytellers, yeah. for uh, philanthropist even, especially in enabling those other kinds of partnerships and... The storytellers talk to me. Yeah, 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 yeah no, absolutely. Well, uh, we're running close on time, but let's maybe bring in the audience for, for one quick question if we can. I think we have mics available um, that are uh, running about, Carly, my colleague. Yeah, I was here. successful in eliminating most of the questions, <laughs> but I still man couldn't manage the last one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Looks like we have one here. Yes. You have questions all over the room. I'll try to be brief. So uh, first off, fabulous. Thank you. Um, to, the, to the point about an, an innovation requires an ecosystem around it to succeed. I think that's a very important insight. It's not just the genius that NSF has funded historically. It's building the system around it. Innovation also requires a market and a consumer. Consumer preferences change. Consumers are not always who we want them to be. How are you thinking about failure? How are you thinking about tracking and, you know, modeling what consumers will be wanting in the future as part of how you think about the engines? No, that's an excellent question. Um, the first part, modeling failure. You know, one of the things that NSF takes pride in is a high-risk, high-reward agency. NSF has always been that, and it should continue to be that. It's very important. So we take pretty serious bets, okay? And we do fail in the discovery space as well as in applied space, and that will be true of RIEs too, okay? One should not shy away from failures, okay? Hope our failures are in the type one level because that's why we have two types. The type one level is a test, if you may. So you could talk, talk, think about it as a market test too, consumer test too factored in, okay? 
as part of the community thinking and the ecosystem development that you're putting together, okay? And so when you go to type two, the failure rates are going to be lesser. Not that they will be eliminated, but they will be lesser, okay? So this is something that we have to, uh, we have to be tolerant of, and we should never hesitate. Ne uh, we all know this. Um, I tell people I've learned a lot more from my failures than from my successes. Mm. I'm sure all of us can attest to that, okay? So that's something that NSF takes pride in, and we will never take that spirit away from uh, how we think about our programs, our investments, and our approach. So I hope that, that, that answers your question. But let me leave you one last thought on that. Um, uh, we are increasingly bringing venture capital into the equation. We are bringing in proxies, if you may. Proxies who bring these kinds of thinking to us that allows us, therefore, to advance with a reasonable level of risk mitigation, if you want to think of it that way, but not elimination. Yep, no, that's fantastic. Um, looks like we're running short on time, so. Oh, she has My a gosh. Question. Oh, she has a well, we have to get one oh, more yeah. question. Thank you, Shalom, for the invitation. This was outstanding. Your Honor, um, one of my questions relates to the NSF engines. I looked at the list and saw that they were in relatively higher income areas. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest that distressed communities, rural communities, BIPOC communities plug in, get to the table um, to be a part of the resource and the ecosystem? system building? Excellent question. So very, very important because for me, um, if you've listened to my other writings and, uh, and, and talks, you will see that extremely important. Our nation's success is integrally tied to the unleashing of talent from places that have been left behind. Here is, I'll say something in general terms and I'll talk about specific response to this. We are at 330 plus million, 340 million people, okay? We need every ounce of domestic talent unleashed. We need to welcome every ounce and retain of global talent and assimilate them. Why? Because if our competitors are 1.4 billion in population, that's how you make progress, okay? Leaving any talent behind is unacceptable. And then I say this also, for far too long, this is my observation, for far too long, we have substituted domestic talent with global talent as a nation. It is an unacceptable future for any nation. We have to ensure that we have to have the domestic talent augmented, not substituted with the global talent. Mm -hmm. Listen, I was a global talent who came to this country, okay? I am so grateful for the opportunities that was given to me, and I feel compelled to serve, compelled to serve every day, okay? So now to how we are doing this. So not only, if you look at the 10, nine of the 10 regional innovation engines have strong partnership with historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and tribal colleges. Mm. And so are the other type one engines, okay? Next, we are also investing in regional development, engine development awards, uh, not development, the, the sort of training to build innovation engines awards. And these are targeting areas and segments of population which have been left behind, particularly rural areas, BIPOC communities, and so on. So at NSF, through various programs, I won't have time to build, uh, tell you all the programs, we are insanely <laughs> focused on ensuring that we don't leave people behind. That would not be a good solution, that would not be an acceptable solution, and that would be a disservice that we do for to our nation. I hope that I have been strong enough. Okay. Super important, super important question and, and response to. Um, well, folks, now we really are nearing time. So I'd like to invite Mary Alice McCarthy, our Senior Director for Education and Labor on stage. We're gonna have some closing comments. Um, so Mary Alice will take stage. Gosh, I could. Go on and on and on, the whole day, the whole week. <laughs> I forgot to bring my step. I'm so I'm gonna, I hope you all can see me over the podium here. Uh, I feel like Queen Elizabeth, you know, just to be a hat up here. No, but um, Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Mary Alice McCarthy. I'm a senior director here at New America, and I lead our Center on Education and Labor. And, um, and my job is to wrap us up here, so let me just start by 
reiterating how excited and honored we are uh, to be working with the National Science Foundation, um, and to thank you, Director Panchanathan, for your vision, first and foremost, for what you've expressed here today about how science and technology investments can, can create a more inclusive society and how there is innovation everywhere in this country. And the question is how do we untap it and how do we get more people connected into it? So um, we're just thrilled to be able to partner with you on that. And we're also thrilled to be able to partner with other organizations in this broader work. Um, in the, um, you know, we're, we are actually working with the American Community College, uh, the Association of Community College Trustees um, on this question of how do we bring and build the capacity of community colleges to protect participate in innovation economies? How do we get their trustees, who are generally trusted community leaders, really embedded in these? So we're excited. Steve uh, Jurgen is here from the uh, uh, Association of uh, Community College Trustees. Um, next month, we're going to be hosting an event with some um, with the uh, commissioner, Commissioner Keith Sonderling of the economic of the um, of EEOC, which I'm now going to. Um, if I don't look down, I will say it wrong. The Equal Opportunity. Um, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and also with uh, Kay Firth Butterfield, the former uh, head of AI at the World Economic Forum and now a New America Fellow working with, with Shalen, and two labor leaders from the Writers Guild of America and SEIU on this question of what is the role of workers and worker organizations in both developing technologies and in deploying technologies, right? So again, we're excited to be working with you on that and, and relaying that information back and be in partnership with you on that, at that important conversation. And just even more generally, we're just continuing our research. We've been doing interviews with community college students who are enrolled in AI programs at their institutions at the associate degree level, sometimes at the bachelor degree level. We just published two of these pieces uh, last week. Um, and uh, the lead researcher for this, um, a young woman named Tiffany Tai, who's on our team, uh, brought us together with some of these students yesterday. Uh, and both were women. They were both in AI programs. They were from very different backgrounds, one at Miami-Dade Community College, the other at Houston Community College. And I just have to say, it just it was a real light bulb moment for many of us of what it means to have very different voices and different people at the table talking about AI, talking about technology, what they see as the really exciting things about it, and what they're scared of, and, and what it means to have them at the table developing it. So, this vision is just so exciting, and watching the National Science Foundation and the administration and Congress execute on it is something we really want to lean into as hard as we can. So thank you very much. Thank you to Shannon. Thank you to you, Director. And also a big shout out and thank you to our communications and events team who put on this, this very successful event today. So we've got some snacks in the back. Please, um, the room is yours. You're welcome to, to stick around and, and chat with one another. And thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're fantastic. Thank you so much.